Greetings, this is a quick medical genetics lecture about the disorders of fatty acid oxidation. This is an important category of metabolic disorder in which the body has difficulty breaking fatty acids down and using them for energy. It's important enough that it's going to constitute three separate videos. In the first one, we'll go through the pathway by which fats are broken down into energy precursors. In the second video, we'll take a look at when any of the enzymatic components of this pathway gets mutated and doesn't work, what the resultant syndrome is. And then in the final video, we'll take a look at ways in which these disorders can be diagnosed by lab tests, most specifically um, with the newborn screen and uh, with something called an acylcarnitine profile. So let's jump into the pathway. So overall, what the goal is, I'll tell you first, and then we'll make sense of all this stuff here. So we're going to start off with either triglycerides or phospholipids. This would be in any tissue in the body where fats exist. Lipases will break them down into free fatty acids, and then it will travel through the bloodstream, go through the cell membrane into the cytosol of a cell, get transformed and go into the mitochondria, and then go through what's called beta oxidation, and I'll explain what that is, in order to make various energy precursors that can be used uh, for energy in the body. We'll also talk about the synthesis of ketone bodies, which is related to fatty acid oxidation. So let's get started more specifically. So these triglycerides or phospholipids um, I've shown here uh, just written out, but each of these will have uh, either three tails in the case of triglycerides and two tails in the case of phospholipids of these fatty acid tails. This squiggle right here, uh, there are 16 points on it. So this is meant to represent a 16 carbon tail. Each of the carbons will have between one and three hydrogens on it. And in this case, this is a palmitoyl group. Palm is just the prefix that we use for 16 carbon. If it were 18 carbons, it'd have a different prefix. Lipases break these molecules down into the free fatty acids. So just a tail plus a COOH. So this is how we represent a fatty acid. This is a carboxylic acid, which you can tell from the C double bond O and OH. And then the R group simply represents all the carbons that are not shown explicitly written out. So in the case of a 16 carbon molecule, here's one C, the R would stand for the remaining 15 carbons. Now, when you start with triglycerides and phospholipids, the free fatty acids you get are mostly C16 and C18 fatty acid molecules meaning 16 carbons or 18 carbons here, and those are long chain fatty acids, meaning that of any of the fatty acid chains that you could have, they're toward the longer end. These molecules are taken into a cell, so this blue line represents the cell membrane, by a long chain fatty acid transporter, and is now in the cell, where it can be combined via an enzyme called acyl-CoA synthetase, with a molecule of CoA. So this is coenzyme A, which is a very versatile uh, handle molecule, essentially, that's uh, part of many different reactions and substrates in the body. What does acyl mean? So acyl is just a term that we use to talk about this fatty acid tail right there. So an acyl-CoA synthetase takes an acyl group from the fatty acid and CoA and puts them together, forming what we call an acyl-CoA. Acyl that fatty acid tail, CoA, stuck together. I've drawn the structure here. It should look pretty familiar, but instead of an OH group being here, that was up there, we now have S-CoA. So CoA is coenzyme A. S is just a sulfur atom that is part of CoA that forms the interface between CoA and whatever it's attached to, and so we draw it there for clarity. The acyl-CoA, the goal of it is going to be to go into the mitochondria, into the mitochondrial matrix from outside. So why do we need multiple steps rather than just transporting it through? The whole reason is control. So this enzyme, for example, is uh, the key enzyme in terms of the rate limiting step of bringing acyl-CoA's into the mitochondria. And the neat thing about having multiple steps and having a rate limiting step is that in times of fasting, when you want to use fats for energy, this enzyme can ramp up. But in times where there's the fed state and we don't want to break down fatty acids, this enzyme slows down. So it's all about control. All right. So this enzyme, it's CPT1, that's carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, 
can also be called carnitine acyl transferase 1, since it doesn't just deal with palmitoyl groups, but other links of carbon chains as well. Its whole goal is to take an acyl-CoA, throw the CoA off, and replace the CoA with a molecule called carnitine. Carnitine starts outside the cell, a carnitine transporter brings it in the cell, CoA gets thrown off, and you're left with an acyl carnitine that looks a whole lot like an acyl CoA, but instead, where the CoA was, we got a carnitine molecule. This molecule is able to diffuse through the outer mitochondrial membrane into the intermembrane space, and then a transporter called carnitine acyl carnitine translocase brings it into the mitochondrial matrix. There's then an enzyme called CPT2, which is carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2, or carnitine acyl transferase 2, that does the exact opposite thing that CPT1 did. It takes a CoA, adds it back onto the acyl group, throws the carnitine off, and then carnitine, via carnitine acyl carnitine translocase, gets shot back out into the intermembrane space and can diffuse through to the cytosol to repeat the cycle. Because carnitine is really just serving the purpose of bringing the acyl groups in and then it itself is going back out, we call this the carnitine shuttle. And as you might have guessed, there can be disorders of this part of the pathway as well. So acyl-CoA, that's what we're left with after CPT2 here inside the mitochondrial matrix. And this is where the pathway really gets to the heart of what beta oxidation is. This is where it starts. And also really, um, I think is a fun pathway uh, in that it just makes sense once you get it. What we're going to do is we're going to do various rounds of reaction. For every two carbons in this acyl group, we're going to do a round of this reaction. So we'll start with an acyl-CoA. If we started off with palmitic acid up here, this would be a 16-carbon fatty acid tail linked to a CoA. So we're going to go around essentially one time for each two carbons in this group. The first enzyme that it meets is called acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. There's several varieties of these. Acyl dehydrogenase is the last two letters. Um, the VLC in VLCAD is very long chain, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. We've got medium chain, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, and short chain, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. These are just three varieties of enzyme that do the same chemistry, but can only handle certain lengths of tail. So for the very long chain molecules, those are the ones that have carbon tail between 12 and 18 carbons long. For medium chain, that refers to carbons of 6 to 10 uh, carbons long. And then for short chain, that is chains of 4 to 6 carbons long. Kind of neat, there's three different enzymes there. In this step, what we're doing uh, is we are, and I've drawn out what an acyl-CoA looks like, got the S-CoA and then a number of carbons here, and I haven't drawn the rest. We're going to go from saturated right here, meaning as many hydrogens as possible, to now being unsaturated. So there's actually only two hydrogens there for the two carbon atoms, and this is called an enoyl-CoA. That's what the reaction is. In doing so, we have electrons transferred to a molecule called electron transfer flavoprotein. Those electrons then get transferred to ETF QO, which stands for electron transport flavoprotein, coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. Uh, this is also called ETF dehydrogenase. And the whole point here is to take electrons from ETF, and eventually we end up with an FADH2 molecule, which you may remember is a substrate that can be turned into ATP in the electron transport chain, which exists right here in the mitochondria. So we've made a little tiny bit of energy just by doing this reaction. So what does this enoyl-CoA do next? It gets reacted by a molecule called enoyl-CoA hydratase, and there's two versions of this. There's a long chain enoyl-CoA hydratase, a short chain enoyl-CoA hydratase. The short chain one has an alternative name, which is crotonase, and it handles the medium and short chains, and then long chain uh, handles the long chain one. You might notice a little dot here. There's a dot on this enzyme, this enzyme, and this enzyme. And of course, these two we'll talk about in a bit. This is actually all different functions of the same protein called mitochondrial trifunctional protein. It's got three functions. And sure enough, these are those three. 
So enol-CoA gets reacted by these enol-CoA hydratases and ends up being a 3-hydroxyacyl-CoA. I've drawn it out there. Rather than having a double bond right there, we now have a single bond and we have an OH up there. So it's hydroxyacyl, hydroxy group right there. I've drawn out these structures. Um, some people get confused by them just to show what the point of all these steps are. And also some people like to think this way with the structure. So that's why I've included them. So the hydroxyacyl-CoA then gets reacted by another set of enzymes. These are the hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenases. There's two of those. One is a long chain one. One is a medium and short chain one. The full names of these are long chain 3-hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase. And then we've got medium and short chain 3-hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase. These are another set of enzymes that throw off an energy precursor of their own. So we have NADH going to the electron transport chain. This is an energy precursor molecule. And then we get something called a ketoacyl-CoA. So once again, we've transformed what was originally our acyl-CoA. And in this case, rather than an OH group on this carbon, we have a double bond to an O. Now one specific kind of ketoacyl-CoA, the one that has four carbons, so it's this structure and the R group is really just one carbon, is called acetoacyl-CoA and we'll visit that in just a second. So let's go to our final enzyme of beta oxidation. These are the ketoacyl-CoA thiolases, and there's three versions of those. The first one, and you're probably guessing what these things stand for at this point, LC, sure enough, is long chain. So this is a long chain three ketoacyl-CoA thiolase. We have medium chain three ketoacyl-CoA thiolase. And then the short one could be called short chain, but instead it's called beta ketothiolase. And this one handles this four carbon ketoacyl group called uh, acetoacyl CoA. I think that this is the most interesting enzyme of this whole cycle because this does finally what we wanted to do, which is taking this acyl CoA, which is a CoA molecule, and then a long chain of carbons with hydrogens on them, and shortening it by a length of two. Now, there would be two opportunities. One would be to just cut the carbons off the end, so this end. The other opportunity would be to cut the carbons off at the end near the CoA, and that's in fact what happens. So what we get is we get a severing right here so that two carbons remain on the CoA, and that is called an acetyl-CoA. So the CoA and one, two carbons. This molecule you may remember from learning about the TCA cycle, which is also called the citric acid cycle, which is also called the Krebs cycle, and that's a key way that the body makes an ADH, an energy precursor, and goes on to form ATP. And from this whole thing, the majority of energy is gonna come from acetyl-CoA going to the TCA cycle. So it's severed that. What happens to this carbon and the remaining R group? It gets another CoA attached to it, and we form a new acyl-CoA that happens to be two carbons shorter than the one that we started with before. So that's why we have to do one turn for every two carbons. Then, as you might guess, when we finally get to the four carbon variety, acetoacyl-CoA, it gets reacted by beta-ketothiolase, and it will form one acetyl-CoA and one acyl-CoA that only has two carbons. But wait, that's just acetyl-CoA. So on the final turn, when we have a four carbon molecule attached to CoA, then we're just going to form two acetyl-CoAs, and we're done. Now, what is beta-oxidation? Carbons can be named relative to other things. So one over from something would be an alpha carbon. Two over from something else would be a beta carbon. So that's just what we're talking about in that two over is where we do that chemistry that ends up severing this ketoacyl-CoA. Now what about oxidation? So oxidation can be adding oxygen or taking away protons. That's the chemistry that happens here in order to get energy out of our fatty acids. And that's why it's beta oxidation could just have easily been called fatty acid breakdown. Now let's move over to this green stuff. What is this? So this is all about ketogenesis making ketone bodies and ketolysis breaking them down to go back into a pathway where we could get energy out of them by an alternative source. Ketogenesis is gonna happen in the liver and it works like this. So once we've done turns of beta oxidation and we get our four carbon variety of this molecule called acetoacyl-CoA. That, via 
enzyme called HMG-CoA synthase can be combined with an acetyl-CoA, forming something called 3-HMG-CoA. 3-HMG-CoA can be reacted by HMG-CoA lyase to form acetoacetate, which is a ketone body that's in equilibrium with beta-hydroxybutyrate, another ketone body. And then the final ketone body would be acetone. Now, ketone bodies are used by the brain, for example, uh, for energy sources. In that case, we actually do want to be able to go from acetoacetate, a ketone body, and go back to form energy precursors via, for example, the TCA cycle. So the first step in that is acetoacetate being reacted by an enzyme called SCOT, which is succinyl-CoA, 3-oxoacid-CoA transferase, comes back to form acetoacyl-CoA. And then acetoacyl-CoA, rather than going back to form a ketone body, would then have to be reacted by beta-ketothiolase, which is what it usually would get reacted by if it were just part of beta-oxidation, to form two acetyl-CoAs. So SCOT and beta-ketothiolase are parts of the ketolysis, or breaking down ketones, pathway. So that's it. Let me review very quickly just to cement this stuff. We've taken fats, that is triglycerides and phospholipids, broken them down into free fatty acids that are in the bloodstream, they get pulled into a cell by a long-chain fatty acid transporter. They uh, get combined with a CoA molecule to form an acyl-CoA. That, via the carnitine shuttle, has carnitine attached to it very quickly, gets brought back in, carnitine gets kicked off, and we're left with an acyl-CoA again. Then we go through this four-enzyme pathway. It's a circle, that is beta-oxidation, in which we are changing the chemistry of this molecule, setting it up to be severed, such that we have a two carbon shorter acyl-CoA and one acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA goes to the TCA cycle, gets used for energy. And also we have some additional energy from these two steps in which we get an FADH2 and an NADH each time we turn the cycle. The four carbon variety of uh, one of the precursors in beta oxidation can be used to form ketone bodies that can be used as energy by the brain, for example. Those ketone bodies can also be broken down and go back in uh, to the cycle briefly to form acetyl-CoA to the TCA cycle to be used for energy. I hope you enjoyed this. This will set you up perfectly for the second lecture, which is all about the disorders, as well as the third lecture in which we'll look at how to diagnose them using lab tests. I'm going to start off with this exact same diagram. So as I said, you're perfectly primed. As always, I thank you for your attention. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or if you would like to submit a video, please contact us at quickmedicalgenetics at gmail.com or feel free to comment on this video. I put some excellent resources down below in the reference section, so feel free to check those out. Take care.